Bitcoin has been flat year to date. If you just take the beginning of the year to now, relatively flat. It's been trading range bound. Let's talk about medium and short term price action with Gareth Soloway, chief market strategist at InTheMoneyStocks.com. Gareth, welcome back. Are you in the money right now or out of the money? In the money, baby. In the money. How you doing, David? I'm doing all right. Thanks. Good to see you again, Gareth. All right, let's yeah. talk about one of your recent tweets. I'm just going to read it. Uh, after coming within $16 of the $48,250 Sorry, $48,250 level I gave below. Bitcoin has pulled back beautifully, as predicted, hitting $45,824. Cue the deleting of comments that said, I would be wrong from bikers who can't control their emotions. Again, members and I just keep printing dollars. Are you the Federal Reserve now? You keep printing dollars? <laughs> uh, I, I wish I could do it as easily as the Federal Reserve. I mean, that's for sure. But but yeah, I mean, you know, bottom line is this was a pure chart play. And, and my point of saying stuff like that is to, I really want people to start to understand that emotion gets you in trouble. Like, yes, I believe in Bitcoin long term, but it doesn't mean it's going to go up every single day from here until eternity. You're going to have pullbacks. You're going to have levels that hit. And that's exactly what we have. If we look at the Bitcoin chart here, it was a beautiful move up into this perfect parallel channel uh, trend line. And the 200 moving average was right there. The Bitcoin was up seven straight days into that too. So, I mean, it was kind of begging to, to be a pullback. And so all we did was we sold our, our long on Bitcoin and then we just ended up shorting it there and now in the money. So again, you know, I, I think there's still a little bit more downside here. First big level to test is going to be right here, just below 45,000. We're getting pretty close. And then that will be the first big test, whether or not Bitcoin can turn around and try to break out or if it's gonna fail and start heading back to the lower side of the channel. That channel seems to be moving upwards though. So maybe mm -hmm. that's a long-term play to stay bullish. What's your take? Yeah, so, so the weird thing about it is, and this is kind of counterintuitive, but channels that are upsloping like this, generally the probabilities are that they break to the downside. And what's interesting about this, if you go back to last year, let's go back to last May and June, you actually had another kind of channel, but this one was downsloping. So if we look at this here and we draw a parallel line, you could see how you were in this parallel. Downsloping parallel channels tend to break up while upsloping tend to break down. So again, all we do here, all I do is technical probabilities, right? The charts basically tell us what's the most likely outcome. And you know whether or not we chop around here for a while, the ultimate outcome for probabilities is eventually to see more downside. Okay. Eventually you'll see more downside. You know, the thing about emotions, you're right. The emotions wreck your trading. They wreck a lot of things yes. in life, but let's just focus on trading for now. That's true. The issue is people stick to a thesis and sometimes when that thesis doesn't play out, I guess egos get in the way or something. We don't admit that we're wrong and we don't admit yeah. that we have to update our thesis and then we just keep buying into that wrong trade. Either we yeah. average down when we shouldn't or we don't get out when we should. Um, yeah. I was just going to say, you're hundred percent right. And listen, every, you know, even, even myself, I mean, I've done this for 20 years and I still struggle with ego. No one likes to be wrong, but again, I think it's important for us. You know, you might be the most bullish on Bitcoin ever. It doesn't mean it's going to go straight up nonstop, right? You have to understand price action. You have to understand that when too many people get bullish and that emotion takes over, that's usually a bearish sign and vice versa on the, on the bearish when overly bearish side, it's usually bullish. So I think people need to kind of just understand that, you know, you can have your long-term thesis like I do that says Bitcoin eventually goes to half a mil, a mil, um, but it doesn't mean it's not going to go to 20,000 before that. And I think that's important to understand is that you have to flush out a lot of the weak hands before it can really regroup, you know, bring back the dot com era. And I've talked about that a lot, how in the dot coms, I mean, yeah, Amazon survived and has thrived. It went to six dollars a share in, in 2000 when the dot com bubble collapsed. And then now it's at thirty three hundred. So you can have washouts and the best and the, the, the brightest will survive. So let's talk about uh, before your let's before we talk about your price action uh, forecast, let's talk about your methodology for trading. How do you determine momentum right now? Or yeah, so momentum is momentum is a great thing, right? It, it's a great thing to understand as long as you catch it early. Now, when you're late to the party, like last October and November, when you were 65,000, 68,000, you can't chase that momentum. You need as an investor to step back and say, okay, Bitcoin has run up way too far, way too fast, and I'm not going to be that person that buys right up at the highs. Um, now, if you start to recognize the momentum shift, and that's the key is, can you catch it as it's just turning? 
And that's where the momentum is. That's where the big money is made. It's very, very hard to do. The only way I've ever found out how to do that is by following the charts and noticing that you're buying at support. All right. Buying at support. Generally, you put the odds in your favor of that move. Okay. So what are we at right now? We're at uh, $45,000 just about. Is that a critical support level for you? Or, well, you said you might expect more downside. So what is the critical support level for you? Yeah, so the first big test is going to be right here at around 45,000. Right now we're at 456. I'm tempted to take a little bit of my short off the table right around there just to protect myself in case we start moving back up. That would be the smart decision. Um if we do break 45, then you start heading back to a lower level here that I'm watching very very closely and this would be your next one connecting these lows. It's around 40,000 and then really the one that investors should be most concerned about would be this trend line here at the very lows. If that breaks, that's where you start getting into the 20,000-ish range and you could see some major downside. Now, on the other side of the coin, let's talk to both sides, right? Because I think it's important to understand that investors, you can't, you don't want to just be focused on one side. And I think that's a major problem with crypto is that everyone's just focused on the bull case. So in my case, I'm more on the bear side, but it doesn't mean I don't look at the bull case. And for me, the bull case is simply that if we were to start trading above this 200 moving average in this channel, and we were to hold there for a matter of days, one day doesn't matter. We've seen that plenty of times reverse. But if you establish yourself above this level here, then you can start saying, okay, maybe Bitcoin can start to really get some momentum and break to the upside because the channel would be broken and the 200 moving average would be broken. Mm. It seems to me like every time I talk to you, your, 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 your band gets narrower and narrower. Like your resistance level now is 600 bucks from our current level. Um, yeah. Whereas before it's, uh, you know, we we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars of differentiation here. Is that, so what, what's going on? Do you think that the, the, the range, the trading range of Bitcoin is just becoming more narrow these days? Well, more than anything, it's just it's just the differential between short and midterm trading, right? So, so you know, ultimately, it's a matter of you know, this is going to be the first support here. I'm I'm thinking it will break, but I'm not. Nothing's guaranteed. So, when I'm dealing with my own capital, I'm not going to be a cowboy and just say, "Hey, I'm going to roll the dice and I hope this goes to twenty thousand. I'm going to kind of protect some of those gains by maybe covering a little bit of that short at the forty-five thousand level. But let's not let's not kid ourselves. Ultimately, Bitcoin remains inside of this range and it's just trading up and down basically. And and as long as it's in this range, it's range bound, and you would eventually expect it to come back here, maybe go back up. Eventually, one of these directions will break, and that that will be the big move in that direction. So it could be up here, it could be down here. Whichever way it breaks investors should watch that because that likely is the next big move on Bitcoin in that direction. Big, big move either way, you're saying? Yeah. So, so if we start really establishing ourselves, and I'm not just talking about a day above this level here, but if we are up there for like three or four days and we're holding above it, starting to build consolidation above the 200 in this, cha this tra channel trend line, then you could actually see, I mean, you, you know, this is a situation where you'll have resistance along the way, but I mean, it opens the door to significant upside. Uh, same thing on the downside, right? So if we break to the downside here, you know, there there is a couple stops along the way. One would be right at this low down here, just below 30,000. But mm -hmm. I honestly would think that if we break this area, we're probably headed to that 20,000 level, which was the 2017 high. What about what if I say to you, Gareth, I'm tired of waiting for Bitcoin's big move, whenever that's going to happen, if it happens. Altcoins, let's look, look, let's take a look at the altcoin market to see what's already moving and what could have more potential in terms of trading and uh, gains. Yeah, so um, I'm keeping an eye on, on Ethereum here. Ethereum into resistance, same thing, 200 moving average. Looks to be in kind of a general trend here. Um, we've seen some big moves on some of the altcoins. I have taken my profits on these at this point. Cardano had a beautiful move up here. I mean, a monster move from about 76 cents all the way up to about a buck 25. It looks like it's stalling, but if it gets consolidation here, you might get one more move up to a hundred and a dollar forty, maybe a dollar fifty right up here. And then if we look at some like Solana, Solana's been a beast over the last couple of days. This thing is going nuts. Um, I'm not chasing this here. I had a position. I unloaded it around 115, 120. Um, so again, at this point, I'm not going to chase it and get back in. But I will tell you, if it gets to the 200 moving average around $150. I would look to short it at that point. So the beautiful thing about it is, is to remember as an investor, you don't have to be a hardcore bull or a bear. 
you can trade the levels and actually make a lot more money, assuming you know what you're doing. And obviously that's the kicker to make sure you know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Come okay. on, David. I know. I know you know I, what you're doing. I Come wake on. up can... in the morning every morning, and I ask myself in the mirror, "Do I know what I'm doing?" <laughs> the answer is never a straight yes or no. It's always somewhere in between. Garrett, just um... winging it. Just winging it. <laughs> <laughs> Garrett, there's a. Okay, so Lana and Ethereum are uh, they're, they're being utilized for a lot of different applications besides just trading and investments. Um, I'm not saying Bitcoin is only used for trading these days. There's utilities uh, being produced and created as we speak. But I'm just saying that uh, there's a lot of demand from, let's say, the NFT side, a lot of demand from DeFi applications. Do you own NFTs, by the way? Are I do not. Market? No, no, I haven't jumped on that bang bandwagon just yet, mainly because I just don't understand it enough. And again, I hope to get a good education in that some at some point, and then maybe I'll dip my toe in the water. I do worry it's kind of like the, the tulip craze of the, the 1500s, I think, or maybe it was the 1600s um, at this stage. Uh, so again, until I understand it, for me, it, it's if I can't chart it well, and from what I know, a lot of the NFTs don't have a lot of volume, it's not super easy to sell them. Um, so then for me, I need to stay on the sidelines until I have a better understanding of the inner workings. Yeah, well, they said the same thing about Bitcoin a couple of years ago, yes, Tula Bubble in 2017, Tula Bubble 2020. So... Uh, it's true. Absolutely great point. Uh, a lot of people don't understand the NFT market. And, uh, and I just like to say this, folks, is that, you know, you don't have to be in every trade. Like, so, so I've missed plenty of opportunities in Bitcoin and I've captured many, many as well. There's been yeah. many stocks I've missed out on and many stocks that I have gotten. But I think it's important as an investor to remember the discipline. It's like you need this kind of free form that you abide by, this strict discipline of what you're going to do, when you're going to do it. Keep that trading journal so that you can monitor every trade you make, especially as a newer trader. And if you if you make a mistake, those are the most important to write down and then identify what you did that didn't work out so you can try to improve upon it. I would have always thought you were sort of an early adopter of new projects. But I guess if you're a technical trader, you kind of have to wait for some sort of his price history to play out yeah. first before you analyze the charts and and make a decision as to how to go in, right? So uh, exactly generally speaking, it. if you're if you're a trader, if you're a TA uh, specifically, you would uh, you wouldn't go into a new project blind without any price history, without any kind of prior trading experience on that particular asset. Yeah, you're you're 100 right. You can't really as a as a technical you know trader because the key is we we go off of past history as giving us levels, right? So I, I need to see what was the pivot low before. And this is one of the reasons why I don't trade a lot of IPOs that are just out on the open market, because I look at them and they have like two weeks of data. And I'm like, well, how am I supposed to figure out if this thing starts dumping, where is my level to exit the trade? I mean, how do you cap your risk? How do you cap your reward? What is your opportunity? Where is your setup? And you just don't have that with newer things yet. I need volume and I need some price history. Don't you feel like maybe you're missing out on a lot of potential gains in the beginning if you're not getting in? Yeah. You know what? The FOMO, there's always going to be FOMO in life. Um, I, I found that out. And, and yeah. at some point, you start to make peace with it. And you just say, you know what? There's going to be a million things I miss on. But as long as I catch a couple thousand, I'm going to have lots of millions in the bank. And I'm good with that, you know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, okay, that's one way to look at it. Or you and your followers can just keep printing dollars, you know? <laughs> We're going to try to do it just like the Federal Reserve. We learned from the best. <laughs> I need to talk about oil. There's a headline I read from CNBC. Uh, Biden or the U.S. to release 1 million barrels of oil per day from reserves to help cut gas prices. Um, okay, that, that seems to be... Um, an important move. So yeah, gas prices, most people would, I'm seeing all sorts of memes like this guy, I don't know, I can't remember who posted this meme on, on social media, on Instagram. He went to, um, he was at the gas station. He called the police. He was like, I just got robbed. Um, can you, can you help? Can you come help me? And the police came over and they were like, you know, what, what's the report? Uh, who, who robs you? Oh, it's gas, uh, gas pump number nine, gas pump number nine robbed me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, gas prices are high. Uh, the U.S. is going to release a million barrels of oil per day from a strategic reserve to help cut gas prices and fight inflation across the country, the White House announced Thursday. Um, uh, how, what do you make of this plan? Is it going to work? 
Yeah. So, so, I mean, it's, it's one drop in the bucket, you know, if you will on oil, um, it, it obviously helps in the near term oil has dropped quite a bit today about, uh, I think it's about 10 per, well, a little less than 10%, about five, 6% today. But I mean, the key is here is that the chart was basically telling you, and, and I still vividly remember two, three weeks ago when oil was trading at 120 to 130. I mean, people were just like, Oh, even Goldman Sachs said it's going to 200 and all these analysts were saying it. And I looked at the chart and I'm like, where the heck are they looking? I mean, I don't understand this because when I look at the chart here, I clearly see that if you if you connect the high here and the high that we made at 130 and you drop this exactly parallel trend line down, you get the exact lows here from basically the last you know 10 plus years, 12, 13 years. And so to me, the charts are always paramount. They always clear away the emotion side of it. And that's what was, in my opinion, taking hold there. In addition, just be logical, right? So, so David, if you think about it, right, you know, all right, we might be missing out on 5 million barrels a day from Russia's oil, but at the same time, oil at $120 a barrel or 130, how much demand destruction, how many barrels a day are not going to get used because no one wants to drive to grandma's house 500 miles away, right? I mean, or, or think about the interest rates going up and what that's doing to the global economy when interest rates on the 10-year are hitting 2.5%. People are struggling now to, to afford houses with the mortgage payments. So there was so much demand destruction at those highs that I honestly never understood the calls for 200 barrels of oil or $200 per barrel of oil out there. I'm in the camp by year end. I think we're going back to potentially $75. And I have no problem going on record with saying that. By the end of the year, $75. That's not a huge drop. It's twenty five percent, and the market is volatile. Oh, is it not oil. not good enough for you, David? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, hold on, hold on. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I live in an exciting world right now. All right, twenty five percent. Come on, <laughs> you're like a bitcoiner. If you don't get three hundred percent in a day, you, you know you're disappointed. <laughs> um, okay, well, seventy five dollars. All right, so you're you're saying that? Uh, well, doesn't that imply lower inflation then? Yeah, it will trickle through. There's no doubt about it. But inflation is is going to the numbers we're going to get are lagging. So you're going to see the next inflation numbers be very hot because it's going to reflect $120, $130 oil. And then as oil comes down, you will see it. Um, but again, is is inflation going to 2%? Heck no. I mean, it's you're not going to see 2% or sub 2% for 10 plus years, in my opinion. Uh, again, this brings me back to gold. I love gold. Eventually, I love Bitcoin when it finally flushes out. Um, but again, inflation, yes, it will moderate. I just don't think it's going back to the levels where the Fed wants it. And I think the Fed will have to turn on the printing presses again You know, later in the year when they see the economy slowing rapidly because of these issues of inflation and Federal Reserve rate hikes. Do you think interest rate hikes this year will be sufficient to bring down inflation? Um, I think it will do it slightly. I think what's going to happen more so is that the drop in oil and the drop in commodity prices that will come back, they'll pull back. That'll bring it down. I also think that if you look at you know the slowing economy, that could bring it down. And the supply side, you know, all these supply disruptions, I think that'll start to ease later in 2022. And then that will help. So, so everyone's going to be like, you know, bowing to the Federal Reserve and be like, oh, they're so genius because they, you know, inflation's now 6% instead of 10% or 5%. My policy or my thoughts on it is no, number one, that's probably mostly due to the supply side, you know, fixing itself and commodities coming down, maybe a little bit due to a slowing economy. But I think at some point you're going to see potential recession by the end of this year, early 2023. I would not be surprised if the Fed has to stop hiking. I still don't think they're going to do more than four four rate hikes this year, even though I think the market's pricing in about eight. Yeah. Just a, one more note on gas prices and we'll move on. Uh, yeah. So the Biden administration is uh, trying to reduce the uh, cost of oil uh, by basically increasing supply. Whether or not that will be successful is yet to be determined. Um, it's been brought up before here in Canada, in Quebec in particular, that the government just reduced its tax on gas. Because if you look at the breakdown of what the price of gasoline is, a, lot, a big chunk of that is just tax ancient. Now, the percentage varies depending on where you are. Um, it's pretty high in Quebec. So it's been proposed that the government to help the, uh, the common folk, they just reduce the taxes on gasoline. The government responded, my God, what a bad idea. Um, and they suggested that high fuel prices could actually be a positive. It could help consumers change their consumption patterns and reduce their dependence on oil. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I tend to, I mean, obviously, you know, you have to think about who you're affecting. So when it's lower income, middle income people, then, then that's why you want to do those tax tax cuts. 
Um, you know, if you think about like what what President Biden is looking to do, I mean, he's got a, a, a midterm election coming up in November. So you better believe he's going to pull out all the stops to try to get oil down, um, even though I think secretly, for the most part, they want to they like the destruction of demand and, and potentially changing people's habits. But high oil and high gasoline doesn't win elections. Right. So I think that's part of it, too. Yeah, for sure. Well, the stock market's not doing great today. The S&P 500 is down 1.3%. Dow's down 1.4%. There's a huge slide today. Um, so we had a big streak, a winning streak in the stock markets for the better part of this week. And then today we had a we had another uh, correction day. What happened here? Yeah, so I think it's just a market that is really overdone, right? So, I mean, we had such an incredible move up in the S&P 500. In fact, the NASDAQ had even a bigger move percentage-wise. I think from the lows of May, 20, May 14th, to the highs a couple of days ago, we were up 15% on the NASDAQ 100. And I would argue that, that if you think about it, the market, this must have been some sort of fake out rally. Because if you told me that the Fed was likely going to do 50 basis point hikes for the next couple of meetings, and that you, know, you have high oil prices potentially damaging the economy, in addition, high inflation, how the heck does a market go up like that, like this? So I personally was shorting into it. I've got QID now, which is which is a two times short NASDAQ 100. Um, I have a few other plays out there as well. But but I think it was a fake out. Um, if you look at the chart here, look at the 200 moving average. The 200 is basically what we checked back to. And now you've seen the big pullback off of that. Um, if one of the things I would just if you would just, you know, let me let me show you guys something really crazy about this. But if you look at the chart pattern on the spiders, this current chart pattern, right? And you look at where we are. If you go back to 2007, it's almost identical. It's almost freaky. And I'll do that right now for you. And again, just bear with me as I flip through this and get back to that point. But if we flip back and let's go back to 2007. All right, here we go. All right. And look at the similarities here. You have the same M top, which by the way, Bitcoin has as well as Amazon had in 2000. And then in my opinion, this is where we currently are, right? Right up here, all right? But again, it's, it's almost identical. And you even see the little double bottom that the spiders had where initially we gapped down on the, uh, the Russia invasion and then we kind of came down to retest that before the big rally up. But if you look at this, this kind of spells what I think is gonna happen here. And it's not gonna be pretty in the coming, coming months and probably the next six to 12 months. Okay, I'm just digesting hey, speechless. That. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> we've already had a big correction. If you take a look at the broader picture since the high in November. Yeah, yeah. I am kind of speechless. So it's not going to be pretty. I mean, so no. what, what is it that we saw in the last couple of months? Was that pretty? That was that was the warm up. That was the oh warm up of this market. I know. But I mean, listen, the bottom line is, I mean, you have to understand where we are. This is this is new territory we're entering that no no one who started investing basically 20 years ago or less has experienced, which is high inflation. All right. So you have a market where since 2009, the Fed has only printed money basically nonstop. It was Q, QE, then QE1, QE2.5, QE Xfinity, whatever. Then COVID comes and they print QE zillions. And then now you have inflation that's soaring and the market can't, I mean, what's the Fed going to do when, when we slide into recession? Or let's just say we're heading that way. What is the Fed going to do to save us this time? Lower interest rates back down 25 basis points or 50 basis points. Is that going to take us out of a, a meteoric decline? I mean, they can't print trillions of dollars again, or you're going to see 20% inflation. The issue, the, the thing is, I don't know if this is just my take. I don't know if they need to save us in the sense that the wage market, so that the, the labor market is so tight, uh, people are applying for jobs uh, and they're just getting a lot of offers. So I, I personally, I think maybe wages could catch up to inflation. And if your living standards don't, uh, don't depreciate by a considerable amount, then I think most people will be fine, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the question, right? I mean, I think that's what we're going to find out is that you have inflation now at 8 to 10% a year, probably for the next few years. Can wages multiply out 8 to 10% a year? I mean, it's possible. I, I, I think that that's the key. Can it do it? And if it does, then yeah, you're right. Then that could be a way for us to avoid a major kind of collapse. You know, one of the things we want to keep an eye on, and this is something that we watched in 2007, is watch, you know, how many, how many loans. And I just saw a recent study that said, car loans were now at you know multi-year highs for being late on payments or in default really? you know that's not a big indicator yet but you just want to start following these things 
And, and then again, with, with inflation, it needs to start coming down soon, or you're right, you're going to have a lot of issues here. Mm. Okay, well, hopefully uh, the housing market doesn't follow. Yeah, the yeah. labor market's weird. I was just reading a post. I don't know if this guy was joking. I think he's probably joking, but he said uh, in a social media post, yeah, I like to uh, just apply for jobs for fun. It's like an event for me. I just make up a fake <laughs> CV and I fill out exactly what the job is looking for. So they, hire, they, they, they get me for an interview. And then I just go on the interview and I ask them, I flip the script around and I ask them, why should I work for you? You know, what's in it for me? And sometimes the employer is either very impressed or they're very confused. Um, people are doing things like that now. So the labor yeah. market is just, there's a lot of jobs being offered right now. So, yeah, it's true. It is true. Um, it's, it's a wild market we're in right now. And the question is, hopefully it lasts. I mean, hopefully that, that demand for labor does last. And, and, you know, hopefully, yeah, hopefully it does. Yeah, hopefully it does. Um, all right, so final trades uh, idea, trade ideas before we wrap up. We've talked about Bitcoin and stocks. Let's save gold for another conversation because we're almost out of time. Um, I know yeah. you like gold, but out of the assets we talked about, um, uh, let's give the audience an update. What are you still the most bullish on right now? Uh, bullish wise, so you got to go with gold here. Um, I also think that there are some opportunities in certain stocks that if they pull back enough, I would start to look at. Um, there were a few tech stocks that prior to this latest rally had been hammered, like something like a Zoom. If it pulls back enough, I would be interested. Uh, this is the weekly Zoom chart. But, you know, one of the things I like about this in the thesis is that if you go pre pandemic before Zoom was a household name, you came right down to that level as if as if the pandemic didn't make Zoom a household name. So to be able to buy it at that level again, to me, is something that was very attractive. I did do it. Um, mm -hmm. I did take profits on it already. But nonetheless, you know, something like that is interesting. On the other side of the coin, I'll just throw this one out to people. But it blows my mind how Costco can have can be at a 40 PE. And again, great company. I go there every weekend with my kids and like we have the greatest time with the samples. But at the same time, you know, <laughs> yeah, why is Costco trading at a 40 forward PE? I honestly don't know. Um, makes me very wary of it. Yeah, I have initiated the, uh, short on it and uh, we'll see if it turns out okay. What's the industry average on that? I honestly don't know. I, you have to look at like Sam's Club, maybe Walmart. Walmart's okay. kind of a potential competitor. But I'll tell you, 40 forward PE is, I mean, that's tech land growth. That is higher than the S&P 500 average, yeah. Yeah, way higher. <laughs> so, so okay. I mean, maybe maybe it's expensive for a reason. Maybe people just really like Costco. If you think I mean, about we it, do. I love it. But at the same time, their earnings are their earnings. You know. Let, so. let me ask you this: Let's say a recession does come. Would you lean towards stocks like Walmart and Costco and Johnson and Johnson Consumer Staples? You would think that, especially in a high inflationary environment. Let's say we have a stagflationary environment where mm. we have a slowdown in the economy, and inflation remains high. My man, my my earning potential is going to be eroded away, I'm going to have to, you know, start uh, cut back on my costs. I'm going to start ch shopping where things are cheaper. So Costco, so Walmart, so maybe recession proof stocks we're looking at. No. Yeah. Although I would, I mean, listen, Costco's awesome, but why is it that every time I go there, I walk out spending three to 500 bucks. I mean, that just blows my yeah, mind. But, and but, yeah, but like that's you. That's not most people. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I just really like food. I guess that's it. But but yeah, I mean, I think bottom line is your question is correct that that you know you have to start looking for value plays to protect yourself. Um, I would strongly recommend some gold in the portfolio. Uh, okay. We've had that you know big breakout and a retrace here. So I think I think and and being in some cash, yes, it's it's an issue when you have inflation is high, but also cash gives you that opportunity where I took advantage of a lot of those stocks like Zoom that got crushed and were able to step in for a huge bounce where a lot of the, them bounced back 30, 40, 50% very, mm -hmm. very quickly. So, so being in cash allows you to jump in opportunities as well. All right. And you're not at NFTs yet. Okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe we got to make a David Lynn NFT. That'll, that'll convince you to I'll, look at I'll the market more closely. I'll buy in a second. You got it, buddy. I will take it. <laughs> All right. All right, man. Well, I appreciate the support. Garrett, thank you so much for coming on the show today and uh, for your insights. We'll speak again soon. Hopefully, very soon. Uh, no spoilers yet. You got it, buddy. Have a great one. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. And thank you for watching Kitco News. Stay tuned for more. And we'll be in Miami next week, so stay tuned for that coverage.